I don't see any issues. Great, we'll start our um, official beginning. Uh, welcome, thanks for joining everybody. Uh, we're really excited to close out our 2020 uh, calendar of our GitOps Community Edition events. Uh, for some of you, it's our Weave online user group. So if this is your first time joining, welcome. Um, jo thanks for joining us for closing out uh, this year of um, great uh, talks that Lee's been giving us, uh, especially during this fall season. We've been uh, really thankful for um, a lot of just GitOps live demos um, to really make concrete um, a lot of the uh, concepts that we've talked about. So we're really excited to um, end this with what some of you may know as our GitOps hands-on. And if this is your first time, then this will be very exciting. Um, so <clears throat> my name is Tamo Nakahara. I run the developer experience team at a company called uh, Weaveworks, and we're excited to have Lee here, who's our one of our developer experience engineers. Uh, and uh, I'll give this a little bit more of an explanation, but the GitOps hands-on is something that we've had online for a while that's created by another one of our developer experience engineers, um, Stefan Pradhan, um, and he just did a new um, kind of revamp of it. So we're really excited that um, Lee will do a walkthrough of it for us here. So quick. Uh, so. If this, um, if you've been joining us for a while, so we've been very fortunate every two weeks, uh, Lee's been giving these talks um, partially for our existing Flux users. So if you have been a Flux user, we really appreciate that you've been in our community um, and you hopefully know that we've been working heads down on the new revamped version of Flux, the Flux V2. And so um, a lot of these uh, talks have been to give you sneak peeks of what's to come and what um, more powerful capabilities of uh, GitOps, we've been able to um, offer uh, with the new Flux too. So um, we're still got more to do, but um, hopefully you can see these and we're always welcome to your feedback. So yeah, please let us know what you think and hopefully you're excited as much as uh, we are. And if you are new, um, all of these talks also kind of give a quick overview in the beginning of what GitOps is and um, wh why you would be excited to have GitOps and what the power is. And then uh, Lee usually ends with a demo that does leverage the projects that we work on, um, which is Flux. So thanks for joining us. Um, so, oops, today, sorry, I should have removed this. This That was an old slide. So, um, as I mentioned, we'll be doing the GitOps hands-on and a little bit of background of the company that we work for. It's called Weaveworks. Uh, hopefully, if you've known us, you know for us from so much of the work that we've done in open source. So, of course, we'll be looking at Flux, um, which is in the CNCF. It's a Sandbox project, and we're very, very close to get it into incubation, thanks to um, the team and uh, the leadership of Daniel Hallback, who some of you know is one of our community managers. He's been doing a great job at that. Um, and then Flagger is another um, open source project that many of you might know from um, Stefan Pradhan's creation. And that's been um, creating this possibility of um, progressive delivery, such as like Canary deployments. And that is a core part of the GitOps hands-on that um, we'll be demoing today. So um, if you're a fan of either, um, you'll be able to see it's truly, truly in action. Uh, we've got many, many more than listed here, but here are some of the few highlights. Um, Cortex is one of ours. Um, it's a project that's built upon Prometheus and um, improves upon it. Um, Weave Ignite is um, a project that was created by Lucas Kallstrom, um, who's also a developer experience uh, engineer with us, and that uh, Lee is a maintainer as well, um, as well as many, many more. So um, if you haven't heard, heard of us before, welcome. Um, our website is weave.works. You can check out our stuff. And of course, we have a GitHub page um, with all of our projects, uh, aside from uh, Flux and Cortex, which of course are in the CNCF GitHub pages. Uh, so uh, quick uh, housekeeping, if this is your first time, uh, these usually go for about 45 minutes. Um, with Lee, I think we've been hitting the end of the hour the whole time. So the, because um, we've got a lot of questions and a lot to cover. Uh, so these are usually about 45 minutes. And if we do go over time, then they get hard stop at 60 minutes at the end of the hour. Um, Here's some basics about Zoom, but during these shelter in place times, I think I don't have to explain anymore. I think the key thing is um, when you do ask questions or often people answer other people's questions, make sure that you choose two all panelists and all attendees in the chat box. Otherwise it will only come to us and other people won't see your questions and answers. Um, oops, what just happened? I think I just clicked on the link. Um, so with that, um, here we go. 
uh, some basics. So as I mentioned, if you are brand new, uh, we just want to cover like what is GitOps. So as you can hear with the word, um, it's Git and Ops. So in some ways we say it's like operations by pull request. Um, where you have a repo as your single source of truth. Um, so that's a real basic definition, but from there, um, hopefully, as you've seen on the bottom here, this is part of our GitOps Days series. Um, we had two events, GitOps Days in May and we just did GitOps Days EMEA in um, November. Uh, so if you wanna check out our YouTube channel, we have fantastic talks that go much deeper into sort of what we think are the both the principles and the patterns, the best patterns of um, what you can start going toward in your GitOps journey. Um, but some basics is that it's not just app dev or just operations, but really it's um, a methodology that crosses um, all areas. In fact, we talk about a lot of um, get, GitOpsing all the things um, and the business value that, that comes with um, having the reliability and velocity and um, security benefits that come with that. Um, also, it's a paradigm or a methodology. It's not one single technology. Of course, we are very, very excited about our Flux project and we work really hard to really get it to the place where we've already um, brought GitOps value, but we're thinking about the vision of really the most powerful way that we could be thinking about GitOps throughout um, the coming years and hopefully decades. And we really do feel that um, um, even if you're not using Kubernetes, you can do GitOps. But if you are using Kubernetes, it really is part of the evolution of Kubernetes. It really leverages the Kubernetes API and what that brings. And it really is sort of the next um, stage and the next way of really um, leveraging the benefits of that technology. So we're excited to be part of that community in a very deep way. Um, as I mentioned, um, we have four principles. So I'll just go through them really quickly. So we do think that um, you can, you know, not everybody has these. So anywhere you start is a great way to start on your journey. Um, whether you're um, using a versioning system with Git or not, uh, really it's the versioning system that um, is really important. Um, we've joked about how some people do um, GitOps with uh, Google Sheets because Google Sheets is versioned, Google Docs are versioned. Um, and so that's one way that some people have done sheet ops. Uh, and of course, uh, we do feel like one of the principles is that you have a declarative system um, and that you have a way in which changes are automatically applied to that system. And then at the end, you have um, ways of having reconciliation um, and ensuring that you have correctness and um, alerts with that. So that's a really, really bare bones way of beginning. This slide is actually from um, one of the keynote talks from our uh, CTO, Cornelia Davis. Uh, so we're happy to uh, follow up and send you any of these links if you'd like to see those videos. Um, we are happy to share um, the journey that we're um, laying out for everybody. So with that, as I mentioned, we have the um, GitOps hands-on, which is something that Stefan created God, time is flying. I, I, I want to say a year and a half ago, maybe more, maybe less. I'm not sure anymore. Um, and it um, leveraged uh, EKS uh, and um, App Mesh. So recently he's done a revamp and it uses, I know, Linkerd and a few other things. So we're really excited that Lee is here to share it with you and really give you um, uh, a concrete example of how you might be not only using GitOps, but also progressive delivery uh, using Flagger. So with that, I'll hand it over to Lee. Yeah, super excited about this. It's, it's crazy to think, you know, um, we did put together the hands-on as a kind of fun, interactive challenge uh, that you would have the ability to get a prize for at KubeCon. What was that in San Diego? And it was, um, it was. with this yeah. uh, cuttlefish. Yeah, with the cuttlefish. That's when we launched the awesome logo from a local artist in Oakland uh, by the name of uh, Nakahara, Tama Nakahara, I think. Can you hand me over a screen sharing, by the way? I can't steal it from you. Cool, thanks. There we are. Cool. Um, so, Tama mentioned we're going to be doing the GitOps hands on with EKS. Um, mentioned Linkerd, we do have quite a few demos now that are doing Flux 2 and we're improving them. Uh, today we're going to be doing EKS and we're going to be using AWS's service mesh. Uh, it's called App Mesh. And they've done several releases to improve the product uh, with a lot of Stefan's direct collaboration uh, and feedback, uh, as well as like bug reports and things like that. So uh, App Mesh is really starting to become a pretty solid product. We're impressed with it. Um, 
this series is called the power of GitOps. And we're focusing on what Flux2 does that makes our uh, new kind of uh, refined approaches uh, that fulfill the needs that the community has identified as we've, uh, as practitioners advanced the practice of GitOps. Um, mainly the, the one thing that's gonna really be shown off in this hands-on is how simple it is for you to create dependency graphs as you initialize your infrastructure. Uh, and we're gonna create an EKS cluster, or hopefully I should have one already by now. So you should check on that. Yeah, should have one. Cool. Uh, so we're, we're gonna make an EKS cluster. We're gonna bootstrap it with Flux against the repository that we create. And um, we're not gonna use any EKS cuddle specific features for that. It's just gonna be Flux bootstrap. Uh, and as we bootstrap the cluster, we're not gonna use any kubectl or anything to write to the cluster. Right. So the very first operation that we have as soon as we get a cluster is going to be enable GitOps, turn it on, and point it to my config repo. My config repo is then going to deploy all of my infrastructure in the proper order, get any APIs that I need installed. Uh, if any errors happen, we're going to be able to use the Flux APIs to view the dependency graph and see exactly what those errors are. And if there are no errors, then our applications are going to deploy to the cluster. AWS is going to open up some network resources for us. Flagger, which was deployed in the infrastructure stage of the GitOps bootstrap, is then going to initialize a canary. And if the canary passes, then our application will be serving on the public internet and everyone will be able to access it. So um, let's go ahead and give things a go. So if you want to do this lab, uh, you can go to eks.handson flagger dev, right? So that's the site here. It's publicly available for you to share with your teams. I, I know many of you have been through the first rendition of this lab before. Uh, shout out to all of the awesome community members and maintainers of uh, key projects that are powering this demo on this call. Um, share this lab with your teams. We've just updated it for Flux2 and it's actually simpler. Uh, so simpler, but more powerful than it was before. Uh, huge upgrade from Flux1. Um, you know, people are going to hit this intro page, you know, talk about the cool t-shirt that we sometimes give out at events. Uh, you get started and then the intro has some sections about what is GitOps as well as what is progressive delivery. Progressive delivery is this concept that's becoming more mature and it's really about how to control traffic uh, and not just coupled to the way that the infrastructure is rolling out, but using our smart network load balancers, be it a service mesh or an ingress controller, uh, to gradually either shift traffic uh, in kind of a progressive rollout or to do things like A-B testing, manual gating, uh, acceptance testing, load testing, and things like that, where you can actually watch the metrics and hook into policy to decide how you release your application with a more granular control than just, hey, roll these pods in and then take these pods out. So progressive delivery, that's what Flagger is going to be able to do for us today. So we'll be using Flux, here's our website. Uh, we'll be using Flagger, as I mentioned. This is the progressive delivery operator, a really innovative project here uh, created by Stefan Kanichi, uh, who's made some very non-trivial contributions uh, here and helped with maintenance, uh, is also on the call today. Uh, I think that Flagger is one of the most innovative projects in our open source portfolio right now. It's able to use Kubernetes native objects. So we're not creating any new resources. We're programming against the core Kubernetes API, the way that it's meant to be used to do progressive rollout in whatever policy you use inside of our Canary custom resource. So uh, this lab, it costs about $7 a day to run. So you can see I've been playing with it over the weekend, uh, just making sure to roll out any kinks and be prepared to show off all of this awesome stuff that Stefan's put together for all of you. Uh, and uh, I've, I've rolled up a bill about 24 bucks because I'm doing all kinds of stuff uh, and running it over longer periods of time to make sure that our billing estimates are accurate. Uh, inside the lab, we have it quoted at about $7 for one full day of operations. Uh, so there are some one-time costs and things like that inside of EKS, but if you only run this lab for like one and a half to three hours, say you get lunch and come back to it, uh, but you go through uh, every single one of these uh, demos that we have to play with different policies uh, using GitOps for Flagger, then um, 
you could probably run up a bill of like three, maybe two US dollars. Uh, so it's pretty insignificant cost and hopefully you can find some AWS credits somewhere or use like your employer's account. Um, we also have cleanup instructions. Uh, so you can be rest assured that you're not going to be, uh, this is well tested. You know, we've been able to uh, make sure that no billing happens after you clean up. So rest easy there. So I mentioned that we're gonna need uh, an EKS cluster. I'm going to use EKS Cuddle for this. It's another Weaveworks and AWS collaboration project. We run EKS Cuddle open source uh, within open roadmap. And um, you can have this cluster config object, which kind of looks like a Kubernetes style API. Uh, we have this checked into the repo. And what I did was I just did a EKS create, EKS Cuddle create cluster file uh, that EKS cuddle directory in the config YAML there that's stored inside of the GitOps app mesh repo that the demo has you clone if you go through the workshop. And you can see here, it just goes and creates all the VPC and the subnets and uh, the node pool inside of EC2 and everything. Set up that cluster for you. It took about 18 minutes, which is pretty typical for creating a EKS cluster with large nodes. And um, we can see inside of this uh, API spec, uh, we have the app mesh and X-ray um, IAM add-on policies enabled. Uh, also, there's just some extra stuff in here that's actually not required for the demo, cert manager and ALB, but um, those things are just there. Uh, we have a single node group uh, called default with a bunch of large nodes. There's two of those uh, with some volumes for storage. That's really just extra, but not necessary for the demo so much. Uh, we're going to be running Kubernetes 118 and US West 2 and the clusters called app mesh. So if I see EKS cuddle uh, get clusters, uh, then you can see that there's our cluster there. Uh, it's created. I could get the info about it and see when. Uh, now, before in this lab, we used to use very EKS cuddle specific features to do the flux bootstrap necessary for like private keys and things like that. We were doing this thing called profiles inside of EKS cuddle. It was very coupled into EKS. Now. After this cluster is created with the new version of the lab, I'm no longer coupled to EKS features. We're just gonna be using the flux command line tool. So if you wanna create your clusters in some other way, uh, you don't have to be tied to the EKS cuddle profiles implementation. Now everything is decoupled directly into flux, uh, which I'm really happy about because it super simplifies the demo and you no longer have to worry about what your cluster names are. Uh, similarly, if you wanted to create your EKS cluster with Terraform using EKS modules, uh, then you could also use the Flux bootstrap module that we have maintained for the Terraform. Uh, we have Terraform provider for that. Uh, if you wanted to use CloudFormation or some other way, or say your organization just provides you EKS clusters when you click a button in a, you know, some web page for self-service purposes, you can still Flux bootstrap that cluster in the same exact way and do this demo on your own infrastructure. And cool. so that is the. Um, I'm just going to skip the create a GitHub repository stuff. Uh, I have all these uh, variables already exported, and that kind of thing. Here's the cluster bootstrap. Uh, so that's the EKS cuddle create cluster. And then now we just want to check that that cluster is actually ready for flux, uh, which this should be pretty trivial. Uh, I just need to fix my kube config. Export kube config. There we go. Sorry, my kube config is a little messed up. There we are. So we can see that, that uh, our cluster is ready for flux. So let's go ahead and do the bootstrap. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier, right, we're not going to use any kube cuddle to write against the cluster. Right, so we want to bootstrap our own personal repo. Oops. Let's bootstrap flux into it. Uh, I believe yeah, I should have GitHub user and GitHub repo set. So I have a, my own fork of this repository uh, with some demo specific stuff on that. Uh, this is going to be using the main branch as per GitHub's defaults. Uh, that's actually optional now. Uh, we do detect it, but it's good to have it be listed explicitly since you might not be using consistent branches across your organization. The personal flag is important here just uh, to denote that I'm using a single user account instead of an organization account in the GitHub API. There's ways around this, but we'd like to do it explicitly. Uh, and then here, I'm going to be syncing the clusters app mesh directory uh, to the cluster. 
Uh, so I want to put all of the flux manifests that actually run the flux controllers to make GitOps happen in our cluster. I want to install that into this repository. Right? So I'm inside the repository already. We're going to bootstrap against it, and it's going to add manifests to it so that I can manage flux the GitOps way from day zero. So let's go ahead and run. Oh, I got to export my GitHub token. Let's just actually get rid of this terminal and use it, this one. There we go. GitOps app mesh. That's what we want. Cool. And then again, nice. Should be good. Repo. There we go. Bootstrap. That looks right to me. All right. So this is going to use my GitHub token. Uh, it's a personal access token on my account. Sorry. Just got to really, I should really fix that. Kube config. There we are. This is going to use the GitHub token on my account to clone down the repository into my temp directory. It's going to generate the proper manifests for installing Flux based off of the options that I applied. This happens internally with Customize. So if you'd like to do this yourself uh, without using our Terraform provider or the Flux Bootstrap command, uh, that's totally fine. You should know that Flux Bootstrap uh, is item potent. So you can actually run this inside of a control loop, and it's pretty safe to do uh, as long as this is the authority for the manifests and options that you want for your GOTK sync YAML. Uh, so if you're a Flux 2 user already, you know what that means. Um, but yeah, you can run this inside of a control loop. We use the same Go library to actually run this install and modify the customization uh, for like templating out and uh, installing all the options for Flux. Uh, to, uh, we use that same Go library inside of the Terraform provider that we maintain. Cool. So here you can see the install has been completed. Uh, it's configured a deploy key. So it's generated an SSH key and put it inside our new EKS cluster. This is some of the first write operations that are happening to our brand new cluster, right? We generate a deploy key, put it into the cluster as the secret, configure Flux inside the cluster, and then sync it up to the GitHub repository. Then we use the personal access token inside of the Flux bootstrap to configure the Git repo. So if I go to github.com slash stealthybox, which is my username, uh, and then I do GitOps app mesh, which should be this fork that I have. And then if I go to repository settings and I look at deploy keys, you'll see here flux clusters app mesh. Uh, this is added, yep, that's today's date, December 14th. Uh, so we just generated a deploy key and Flux Bootstrap has now configured our cluster, or sorry, configured our repo with the deploy key that was generated for the cluster. So this used to be a dance that you would have to do back and forth to install Flux, uh, but with Flux Bootstrap, you're able to get everything started up. Now, what's going to happen, right? We just hooked up our cluster and started it with GitOps, right? Uh, what's in the repo that we told Flux to sync to the cluster? Well, if you go to the clusters app mesh directory, and let's just make sure to do a git pull here. This is because Flux has updated the repo. You can see that it's added a GOTK components, GOTK sync, and a uh, customization YAML for Flux system inside of the app mesh folder. So the whole app mesh folder is getting synced to the cluster. There is the Flux system directory, which has our bare repo configuration, as well as the uh, clusters app mesh applied for that. You can see that um, you control Flux through these custom resources. There's a Git repository and a customization resource. Uh, here are all of the controllers that are necessary to actually run Flux. There's a bunch of network policy here, as well as uh, cluster role bindings and things to allow for some privilege access. Uh, and then a bunch of CRDs and deployments and stuff. Uh, so there's four controllers in there. And then we have this apps YAML and this infrastructure YAML. So we don't just want to sync the just one directory. We want to do more than that. 
Uh, and we can use Flux to sync multiple paths from one Git repository, or we could sync multiple paths from multiple Git repos. Uh, so here we're using one repo, but multiple paths that are dependent on each other. This is the power of GitOps dependency management kind of highlight bullet point that I wanted to point out. So here we have a customization using that same Flux system Git repo. And we wanna sync the infrastructure directory cluster add-ons, right? So here infrastructure, there's a cluster add-ons folder. Then depending on if cluster add-ons syncs properly, I want to sync the infrastructure mesh folder to the cluster, right? So we'll first synchronize all of Flux, get it installed. And once Flux comes up, we want to install the cluster add-ons, then we install the mesh. And then after that, we install the mesh add-ons. The mesh add-ons is going to be dependent, or it's going to have a health check. So once the app mesh gateway uh, service and deployment are ready, then the mesh add-ons folder will be considered finished. That will be our infrastructure deployment. So it's three customizations that are syncing paths from the same Git repository that's already cloned to the cluster. This is why the objects are separate. We have a custom resource that syncs or fetches the Git repository into the cluster's source controller. And then we have customization or customized controller that uses customizations to actually apply different paths to the cluster on different intervals with different dependencies and uh, whether or not we're going to do validation, do pruning, you can you know make certain things append only versus other things that are pruning, and you can have different paths um, based off of what source you're looking at. So once the infrastructure is synced to the cluster, then we have the apps folder, right? So in the apps YAML, uh, which is inside of our app mesh or cluster directory here, dip, once the mesh add-ons becomes healthy. So that includes the uh, app mesh gateway service and deployment becoming healthy. Then we will every 10 minutes be synchronizing our apps to the cluster. Right? And we could also install webhooks and things like that. That comes from the apps folder. So in the apps folder, we have a instance of a load tester application as well as pod info, which are things that you've seen if you've been able to tune into our demo before. So, yeah. So let's go see how things are going, right? I mean, we just talked about a crap ton of things getting installed into the cluster. There's a dependency tree. All we did was do a flux bootstrap and you're telling me this is supposed to be installed. Yeah, well, if you look at our demo, what do we need to see to kind of get a more clear view of what's happening? Okay, let's get a full terminal here. I'm going to do flux get customizations. This is very similar to just running kubectl get customizations. And here what we can see is that we have that apps installation. It has been, it's ready and has been applied. Right. If I would have showed you this a little bit earlier, you would have seen the dependency tree rolling out. Some of these would be ready and some would not be, some of them would not be applied. You can see everything's been applied to the same commit because we're just applying different folders from the same source. But if these were hooked up from different sources, you would see different commits here. Um, none of these are suspended, so they're all being actively reconciled. We have the Flux system, cluster add-ons, mesh, mesh add-ons, and apps installed. So everything should be synchronized to the cluster. Uh, our dependency tree rolled out without error. Um, I kind of wish that there would have been an error so I could have shown you how great the uh, error messages are inside of uh, Flux, yeah. Can I jump in? Yeah, what's up? Tell yeah, me. Andreas is just asking, could you please show the bootstrap command just one more time? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I didn't do anything special. So here it is inside of the, um, the demo. Uh, it's Flux bootstrap GitHub. So we also have a GitLab subcommand. And as we uh, improve the Go Git provider support, uh, we'll be able to add additional ones here. Uh, but basically, this is how you would bootstrap with a GitHub repository. Uh, and then everything else is driven by the environment variables at the top of the lab for your own user and that kind of thing. So. Okay. Yeah, he was asking, uh, did this target an existing repo with those manifests? 
Yes. Uh, sorry. Yeah, Andreas, I, I can see your question. Add the flux yeah. system part to it. Yep. So basically, we saw uh, when I pulled down that extra couple of commits uh, that flux added. Um, this flux system folder was not here. Uh, but yeah, we had an existing repo that already had the dependency tree for everything that we wanted to sync to the cluster in it. So the very first thing that we did when we do Flux Bootstrap, this is the only thing that's necessary to roll out all of your infrastructure in the proper order to actually have all the dependencies for your applications to come up. Uh, it all synchronizes without error to the cluster from the first operation that you do. Brand new EKS cluster, you sync an existing repo with manifest to it. I could make 10 EKS clusters that look exactly the same uh, with this one command. So great question there. Yeah, hopefully that makes things a little bit more clear. Thanks for us. Uh, thanks for asking to stop there for a second. Uh, it's very helpful. I'm sure for others as well. Sweet. So um, we have everything synchronized to the cluster, right? This is GitOps. This is magic. I mean, I've, I've never done any kubectl apply. I've never had to use, uh, you know, any special access. Uh, as just have my administrator privileges to set up the cluster. Once Flux is bootstrapped, now we can talk to it uh, through the Git repository. Um, here, we just also want to verify that Flagger, Prometheus, and the App Mesh Controller and Gateway Helm releases have been installed. So you're saying, oh, okay, Helm releases? Uh, this is another powerful bit of Flux, is that we have a Helm controller. So here, part of these uh, infrastructure bits are being managed with Helm, but they're not just being managed with Helm, they're being managed with Helm in a declarative way using Git with Flux. Right. So I want to see the Helm releases in every namespace. I'm expecting that there's a gateway namespace, a system namespace for App Mesh, as well as the Kube system namespace for the metric server installation for a core add-on. Right. So let's go ahead and check on that. And so here we see there's a bunch of Helm releases, and they are all ready. That's great. You can see the different revisions of our add-ons that are installed, and whether or not the reconciliation passed. Again, if there were granular errors for each one of these things, we would be able to then say, do a uh, kubectl, oops, describe Helm release. Uh, and then I could say, I want to make sure that the kube system, you know, metrics server uh, install is correct. And if there were issues, then we would see inside of the events or the status conditions, uh, specific errors and you know which times uh, they showed up. So great stuff there with Flux. All right. So great. That's GitOps. What about progressive delivery? Right. Now I mentioned that everything inside of the repository should already be deployed. We saw that uh, Flagger uh, was ready. If we do a uh, we get deploy a Flagger. We can see here's the flagger uh, installation inside of App Mesh system. And then we have the load tester uh, already deployed and ready inside of apps. Uh, so flagger is installed. Um, but do we have an initialized canary yet? What does that mean? Well, if we do kubectl inside of the apps namespace and we get canaries, we can see that there's a pod info canary that's been initialized. What is a canary object? Well, if we look inside the repo, um, I mean, we go into apps inside of pod info, there is a canary YAML. This is a flagger custom resource extended API. Uh, and we are able to configure flagger to interact with app mesh. So when I say, have an installation in the flagger. It's hooked up to my service mesh already. I create a canary object, and then I can target a deployment in the same namespace. So a pod info deployment with a horizontal pod autoscaler that matches. Uh, I can upgrade that from Kubernetes normal service routing and rollout strategies, the rolling update, to something that is more granularly controlled by my canary policy. Uh, so I can say uh, that over the course of a minute, you know, on this particular service, you know, that's integrated with App Mesh, you have some options here. Uh, I want to do a canary analysis that for every 15 seconds, 
um, progresses from 0%, like no, no traffic whatsoever going to my new Canary deployment uh, to 30% of the traffic being routed to my Canary. And then I want to progress in steps of 5%. During that canary analysis, I want to make sure that the metrics for success rate, this is an HTTP protocol success rate. So we're using Prometheus uh, under the hood here. Uh, I want to make sure that that's above 99% successful. Right? So the minimum is allowed is 99% over one minute interval court blocks. And that the duration of the P99 latency is maximum 500 milliseconds. If our P99 is starting to go through the roof, then something's probably wrong with the canary and we need to look at our application deployment strategy a little bit more. Uh, while that's happening, <laughs> before I actually do the rollout, I wanna make sure that the application is healthy, right? So I have some acceptance tests uh, here. I just wanna make sure that I can hit the main URL uh, and that it doesn't time out. And then um, I also want to do a load test. Yeah. So here we're using the Hey command line tool to perform a synthetic load test so that when we're actually measuring these metrics, uh, and what is this? The type is not, yeah. So the load test happens during the canary analysis. So for the entire canary analysis, we're going to be injecting some uh, good traffic to the application. So cool stuff there. You can see how granular uh, you can get about the way that you want your to deploy this is way more than just deploy a new pod every 30 seconds you know or like expand you know uh, my surge you know 25 percent beyond the maximum amount that i normally want from replica set uh this is this is actually getting into how does the application work what are the metrics telling me about how things are rolling out and you can use the canary object to do this kind of progressive delivery so we see that the canary object is initialized but that just means that everything is serving and ready. Let's go ahead and calculate the URL uh, and just make sure that everything's actually being served. Because um, there's like things like DNS propagation in a live demo that need to occur. So this is looking probably pretty good. Cool. Here's our pod info application with our dope cuttlefish, right? And so that's out on the public internet. We've got uh, ingress inside of the uh, or NALB, and then we're ingressing into App Mesh uh, through AWS's services there. And that's all set up uh, with our initial cluster bootstrap. Again, the only thing that we've done is flux bootstrap. So you can see lots of moving pieces uh, in the infrastructure that we've defined, uh, but there's only actually one declarative step to roll it out into the cluster and get everything up and running. Right. Now let's go ahead and do a deployment. Right. So the way that Flagger works is that this deployment copy is what's inside of my repo. Uh, but I mentioned earlier that you could actually upgrade a running workload inside of the Kubernetes cluster into a flag or canary, right? If you do a kubectl get and apps, uh, which is our namespace, and you actually look at the deploys, oops. Oops, getting a little bit typo there. You can see there's a pod info deployment with zero ready pods. Seems kind of weird. Well, that's actually expected because we've upgraded this pod info deployment uh, into an initialized canary. And so this is the canary. It's the copy that's inside of our repo. When we change the copy inside of our repo, we'll get new pods here on the pod info deployment. We can analyze whether that new part of the deployment is ready to go. And if it passes the canary, then Flagger will copy the pod info spec into pod info primary. Now the primary copy is a consequence of the canary object. And it's actually what's receiving the production traffic right now when we go into say our browser and uh, hit refresh or ping. These responses are coming from the primary copy with those two running pods. So I wanna change the canary copy inside of my repo, right? This is kind of the original uh, source of our declarations. If I go into the customization and I change the tag to 501, right? And then say I go into the deployment and I add a festive image using this pod info environment variable. So I'm just gonna get an image from somewhere on the internet 
You can see here it says Christmas royalty free music JPEG, right? Then I can use Git uh, to then, oops, to make sure to go into our repo here. So we can see here, my command line is telling me that there's been a change inside of my repo. Uh, I'll go ahead and do git add. And let's view the staged diff just to make sure we know what we're doing. So we're gonna have a new tag on the pod info customization using customizes templating features. And we're also just gonna modify the deployment YAML directly. I could do this in Apache YAML or any number of things. But, uh, we'll go ahead and commit that and just say, deploy festive v501, right? So let's go ahead and push that up to GitHub. I'm just interacting with the Git repository using the Git command line tool, right? And for interest of time, we're reconciling certain parts of the Git repository. The apps folder is getting reconciled every 10 minutes, uh, but we want to just, Make that a little bit faster. Oops. Uh, oh, we just need to do the flux system. That's right. So we'll update the Git repository source inside the cluster when we do flux git uh, sources git. We can see that we've been updated to this revision. Uh, that's the one that we just pushed, right? I do like a git log and one one line. Oops. You can see that's the most current revision. Uh, that's been synced to the cluster, it's been cloned, right? This is the repository that has every single one of our paths. Now, if I do a flux get customization, oh, uh, plural, we can see that every single one of these paths that's applying uh, through the dependency tree has been updated. And so I should be able to, for instance, see now that we have a canary rule out deployed. I actually may have even taken a little bit too long there because if we actually were to uh, say it's tail tail, or what I need to do, this is trying to get some logs message. I need to copy this from the demo. So we did the promotion here. This is just how to modify the manifest using YQ. Uh, I just did that manually inside of my editor. Uh, we did a reconcile of the source, get customizations here. Yeah, let's go ahead and look what's the uh, state of the canary object. So previously it was initialized and now it's progressing. You can see the weight of the amount of traffic that's, or that's currently being sent. And then if we look at the flagger logs, this is what I was interested in actually reading. So here we see that the canary weight's been advancing. Um, so more traffic is being sent uh, to the pod info application. Uh, we should be at about 15% right now. And I'm kind of curious. It seems like it's actually returning 501 more frequently than it should be. We're certainly getting traffic from our canary, but I'm a little bit perplexed to see that sometimes we're not getting 500 still because that should be more often right now. Maybe I didn't deploy the right tag. Might have to look into the uh, virtual service. But yeah, this is the uh, flagger controller locks. So this is deployment from the app system or app mesh system namespace. Uh, and you can see that it is attempting to configure the app mesh virtual service. Uh, it should be a describe virtual service. Yeah, should be, and then all namespaces. This has the spec, which then has the router. It's 
describe a virtual router. A router has, here's the weight. Uh, okay, yeah, we've already hit 100 here. It's a little bit interesting to me. I mean, it is strange to me that the logs are coming in so slowly. Oh, okay, yeah, we already finished. So here we go. The uh, canary was successful. So you can see um, that when we advance from 0 to 5 to 15 to 30% of our traffic being sent to the pod info uh, canary copy, and so it's like the original copy of our deployment that we changed inside of our Git repo. Uh, when Flagger notices that, uh, it starts sending some traffic to it. Uh, if the canary analysis completes successfully, then it copies pod info to pod info primary. Uh, and then it waits for that rollout to finish. Once that rollout is finished, then we route all of the traffic back to the primary. Right? So that's that 30% that was going to our canary copy then gets shifted back over to the production traffic. Uh, then this gets scaled down uh, and the promotion is considered completed. And if you look at the canary object, you'll see that it's been succeeded and there was a last transition time. Uh, similarly, if you were to, instead of getting that canary object, if you describe it, then you can see all of the events uh, that were in the flagger log also show up on the canary directly. Uh, so if you don't, you know, if you're running like 10 different canaries at once for different services because your cluster infrastructure is just that huge or you have that many dev teams, uh, you can use a single flagger controller uh, and either get a uh, real-time log of everything that it's doing, uh, or you could get the kind of namespace per object uh, events you know, directly on the uh, canary object. And, uh, it's just a little bit less readable here because sometimes the events get into a strange order. So. So that is the um, kind of main canary demo. There's one other thing you could do here, which is instead of doing the canary, you could do the AB test. Uh, and that's the AB test YAML. Uh, and this one, instead of doing a traffic shifting kind of rollout where it moves the traffic from the primary to the canary, you can actually just uh, match off of the headers you know, inside of HTTP. So you could say match on user agent using regex. Uh, and I mean, I could try to do a quick deployment of this. Let's see. Uh, let's do. And we'll want to actually change some things here. Let's pick a different image. And let's go to the deployment change. Let's change our image. Let's change our color. Oh, the color can sure. How about orange? And we'll modify this to go back to 500. A B test Thanksgiving. And then we'll just make sure to sync that source, which should very quickly apply the canary object and application differences. And then if we were to get the canary, uh, let's just get the customizations. They might not be finished applying yet. Mesh add-ons is not ready. Can you change anything about the add-ons? Oh, did our gateway go down? App mesh gateway. Looks healthy to me. Okay, cool. Everything's applied now. I was just rolling up. So we can see that our expecting. I might have done that in not enough steps there. 
Oh, yeah, we already have Thanksgiving deployed. Here we go. <laughs> so that, that canary succeeded very quickly, I suppose. I, I might need to look at the spec there a little bit more. Anyway, <laughs> you should do the you should do the demos uh, instead of just dorking around like me. Uh, it's probably going to take you a little bit longer than just an hour to say, like, get set up, get familiar with everything. Uh, this is normally something that we would like to play at a conference. Uh, so I try to get through as much as I can uh, on this kind of a demo where we're also introducing concepts like what is GitOps and what is progressive delivery. Uh, if you look at the guide, you can see that we have the uh, automated canary promotion with traffic shifting. We've got A-B testing. There's also a rollback example. Uh, so PodInfo has a feature where you can actually inject failure. You can just hit a, a route on the URL that returns a 500. Uh, and if you do enough of those while you're doing canary rollout, uh, then if you read the flagger logs or look at the events on the canary, you'll see that um, the advancement of the traffic uh, getting shifted or doing the A-B test or whatever strategy you're doing uh, will be halted until the metrics can recover. And if you fail on the threshold, uh, then the canary will be considered failed. And you'll actually just, it'll just revert the uh, canary and not affect your production traffic. Uh, similarly, you can do the tests. We actually demoed this uh, already inside of our uh, canary object. Uh, this may have been affecting some of our rollouts. Uh, because I was injecting load and doing like a pre rollout check. Um, and you can run your own tests and see how that affects things and also do manual gating. So if you wanted to say, uh, hook up your canary analysis into a Jenkins pipeline so that it doesn't get promoted until your manager clicks a button that says deploy the application or your product manager, or whatever, then you can do that kind of thing with flagger canaries and the very granular uh, access to controlling policy about how the rollout occurs. Uh, very cool stuff. Please uh, go check out the labs. Uh, and again, you know, feel confident this is not something that costs a ton of money. Uh, you can run this in your own account, uh, or you know, if you're even if you're at a startup or a small company, um, just talk to your manager. Say, hey, I want to spend you know five dollars in AWS today to play with some progressive delivery stuff that we've worked in. Um, do you think that that's cool? And uh, I'm sure you know they'll be cool with it because the the cleanup instructions will get everything. You know, so it's not affecting your uh, account. Go and try the lab. Um, so, it's it's brand new. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Yes. Let so, me have, so we have some questions, but let me take over and I'll actually share the link. Um, hopefully people can see this. Can you guys see that? So here's the bit.ly to the um, um, the hands-on. Um, and we had a couple of questions. One um, said, I'll wait to the end, but um, Jane was asking, what are your thoughts about using GitOps for underlying infrastructure itself? For example, instances in Kubernetes clusters themselves. I've seen ideas about um, using CubeStack, for example, GitOps for Terraform, Crossplane, for example, using Kubernetes CRDs to control infrastructure, which would allow me to use uh, Flux. Is that Flex or Flux GitOps? I'm not sure. To Flux, manage the infra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, seems like there are a number of ideas out there. Wondering if WeWorks has thoughts on best practices. Yeah, super, uh, super cool question. I have two demos that are related to this. Um, they are not official guides that we have uh, within like the Flux guides yet. But if you just go to uh, my personal repositories, uh, there is multi-cluster GitOps. So both of these uh, don't require any kind of external infrastructure like EKS or things, but you might need a beefy laptop. So it might still be good to use a bigger VM if you have like a Chromebook or something. Um, Cappy Flux demo is something that I've done previous recordings of. Uh, the I think it's like part two and three uh, that we did of this series. They're available on recordings on YouTube. Um, yeah, thanks, Kenyan, so much. And then, yep, there's those two, multi-cluster GitOps and Cappy Flux demo demo. And uh, these two links, the first is does some GPG verification demos. Uh, and that's kind of a wonky thing. I need to make the readme a little bit better because there's some bear traps there if you don't do it right. Uh, but then the, this part of the demo does flux with cluster API and cluster API provider Docker. Uh, so if you're interested in like a, an example of how to use cluster API with flux to manage a multi-cluster environment, uh, then this is this has some introductory concepts. 
Uh, you can even use Flux inside of a management cluster to install Flux inside of other clusters if you want to do that. Uh, that's not something that I do in this demo because it gets a little bit complicated, uh, but, and we don't really have a good bootstrap flow for it. You have to like do it yourself. But uh, if you just want to have a single Flux management cluster, uh, then you could basically copy and paste this and then change all of the Docker infrastructure clusters into cluster API provider AWS or uh, you mentioned Kubestack. I'm not sure what their custom resources look like. Uh, oh, that's Terraform. Yeah, so if you wanted to use Kubestack with Terraform custom resources uh, to create infrastructure and then get kubeconfigs for things, you just install those kubeconfigs into your management cluster and you can use Flux to do uh, a remote cluster feature for applies across clusters. Very cool. Um, use a similar feature set, but instead of using cluster API provider Docker, we just use Kind. Uh, and then this is an example of doing mesh routing. Um, so we use BGP on your local machine uh, to do some uh, really cool service interactions between your clusters so that you can get a better kind of cross-cluster networking without having to mess with ALBs and ingresses and stuff like that. Uh, go check this demo out as well. If you're interested in the networking bootstrap portion of your infrastructure, uh, uses like gossip to figure out what the cluster nodes IP addresses are and stuff. Um, so that was uh, from a KubeCon talk. If you want to see the recording there, uh, it's from this year's KubeCon. And uh, cool. yeah. Um, we have a specific question from Andreas. Um, going back to the demo, how am I able to identify the different versions during rollout? Example, For example, with Prometheus, are there some additional labels added to deployments during the Canary? Or is it just always like XXX and XXX das primary as deployment name? This is a great question. I actually wrote a bug fix for Flagger to fix annotation and label copying. Um, and I can't quite remember uh, exactly how this worked. The uh, pod info templates actually have the labels uh, added on there. Uh, so there's the name which you can differentiate in Prometheus, but if you want to do a label, like a label collection through like an aggregated query, uh, I forget what the actual Prometheus terms are for that, uh, then it's possible using like here you see labels, it says app pod info, uh, but then here uh, in the pod info primary copy, then the app label has been updated. Uh, and then you can see the annotation, there's a flagger ID for which canary rolled that thing out uh, on the uh, primary copy. Uh, but that annotation is not present on the uh, original pod info copy. So uh, there's some things like that. Also, uh, there are some specific things with regard to customized controller uh, and the uh, checksum uh, of the manifest generation uh, that was that produced that resource. So there, there are a few things that you could select on there if you were kind of trying to figure out how are these things different and how could I aggregate metrics on them? Uh, yeah. Cool. Excellent. Well, thanks everybody for joining us um, for our final <laughs> move for the year. Uh, thanks Lee for doing this great series. We really, really appreciate it. Um, so we're already planning for um, the series to continue in January. We're really excited actually. It's not posted yet, but um, some of you might know um, Scott Rigby, who's on our team, who's a Helm maintainer. Um, Scott's given some great talks on sort of the value of um, GitOps with Helm together. Um, so he'll be giving a, kind of a new version of that talk uh, to kick off the year. And then we'll um, be bringing you other great talks as well on a variety of GitOps topics. Um, if you have any requests, of course, always reach out to us. Um, we're here to serve you. We're here to <laughs> make sure that we're offering all the information and answering questions that people are looking to um, find out information about. So. Um, if you haven't joined us yet, um, our meetup page is probably our best calendar of events. So if you haven't joined that yet, we have a variety of meetup pages um, here. We have one for the GitOps slash community, easy to remember. Um, so definitely join those and so you'll get the um, reminders for these upcoming events. And then um, make sure you check out our um, Flux page because we have, um, we've been using Get up GitHub discussions quite well. So that's a great place to ask questions and uh, make requests or what have you, or start threads about things that you want to find out more about. And we're happy to help you. So thanks again. Um, 
thanks for closing out this year, <laughs> this very crazy, crazy year with us. And uh, we always love seeing everybody and uh, we'll see you next year. Thanks so much, Lee. Thanks everybody. Bye. -bye.